everyone. This is Tom. Uh, we're going to introduce the, the final session of the day, which is a, but it's a very interesting one on urban stormwater. And it's my privilege to introduce the moderator for the session, Richard Looker, who's a, I say, a key staff person that works with me at the San Francisco Bay Board. Richard's our, our representative on the Technical Review Committee, but at the Water Board, he is either the lead or a key advisor on basin planning, water quality standards, uh, TMDL development implementation projects, and, and he has been responsible for for putting together the 303D list of impaired waters for quite some time. And uh, those who engage with, with him know he's very astute and good at the bridging science with management stuff. So I uh, quite you know, pleased that he's involved with the RP work of the RP. Oh, and this just in, it turns out there's been a complete sweep that all moderators today have degrees from UC Berkeley because Richard uh, made this made the wise choice of getting his master's in environmental and civil engineering there before coming to work for us. So go Bears! Take it away, Richard. Thanks, Tom. Um, so we are in the home stretch now, and I know that spending a day on a Zoom conference like this is grueling, and you may be fighting fatigue. But hang in there. Um, this would be a good time for me to stand up and lead a brief round of virtual calisthenics, but like a lot of you, I'm wearing pajamas on my lower half, so I'm not going to do that. Fortunately, we have three outstanding presentations that will easily overpower both your need for an afternoon nap or your urge to check Twitter for the latest gossip on the COVID-19 super spreader event in the White House. For this last session, we are going to turn our attention to urban stormwater particularly how urban stormwater impacts water quality and how we can mitigate these impacts through the use of green stormwater infrastructure, which is often shortened to its acronym GSI. Urban stormwater, as most of you know, is a major pathway by which contaminants reach receiving waters everywhere in the world, including San Francisco Bay. And accordingly, for more than two decades, a lot of RMP resources have been devoted to identifying contaminants in urban stormwater, how these contaminants are transported from watersheds to receiving waters and the biological effects they cause once they arrive. The presenters in this session approach urban stormwater at different scales. We're going to start out at the level of the molecule. Ed Kolodje will tell us how he and his colleagues solve the mystery of which contaminants in stormwater are causing problems for sensitive aquatic species like salmonids. We will then zoom out to the macro scale and get an overview from Josh Bratt on GSI and how these systems are being implemented by Bay Area municipalities and the challenges they face in that implementation. Finally, Tan Zi will inform us about the powerful modeling tools available to assist municipalities in developing optimal plans for GSI implementation. So batting leadoff in our session is Ed Kolodje. Ed is an associate professor of environmental um, sciences at the University of Washington, Tacoma, and also an associate professor in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Washington, Seattle. Ed is also a principal investigator at the Center for Urban Waters in Tacoma, Washington, where he and his research group use advanced mass spec and hard work to investigate contaminant fate and transport and ensure ecosystem health. He got his PhD from UC Berkeley, go Bears, and he loves SFEI and Squirp so much that he wants the Center for Urban Waters in Tacoma to be just like them, except for Puget Sound. Ed greatly misses the cheap and wonderful food options in the SF Bay area, and I have a brief editorial supplement to Ed's bio because we were in the same cohort at Berkeley when I was getting my master's, and he was in his first two years of his PhD program. I can attest to the fact that um, in, in addition to his academic credentials and career attainment, he's a highly skilled billiards player and accomplished beer drinker. So let's get started. Remember to enter your questions in the Q&A box and indicate to whom they are directed. Ed, take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, Richard. I appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, Richard is also an excellent uh, beer drinker and billiards player. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I, I hope everybody can see my screen right now. Uh, I think we should be good to go. Um, yeah, so th thanks for this invitation to uh, present today. Um, 
I'm here at the Center for Urban Waters in Tacoma. That's this beautiful uh, orange building you see right here. Uh, people I'd really like to acknowledge, uh, some of my research group, Zhen Yu Tian. Um, he's really done some amazing work with us over the last two to three years. Um, super strong researcher and made some real breakthroughs for us. Similarly, Kathy Peter, uh, a wonderful postdoc we had. My technicians, Melissa Gonzalez and Christopher Wu collected a lot of the data you'll see. And for any data that's kind of ecotoxicology related, uh, that's almost all collected by Jen McIntyre, who works at the Washington State University uh, Ecotox Lab in Puyallup. So that's about 10 miles away from Tacoma. Um, yeah, so I'd really like to thank them. Uh, a few acknowledgements for funders. Uh, again, we've worked a lot with the WSU Puyallup Stormwater Center, especially Jen McIntyre and John Stark. We collaborate a lot with the NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service Lab with Nat Schultz uh, and Jessica Lindine there and many others. Uh, similarly, the Suquamish and Puyallup tribes have been really big collaborators here, along with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the Washington State Department of Transportation and the Federal Highways Administration. Uh, some of this work's also supported by the National Science Foundation and the EPA National Estuary Program through the Washington Department of Ecology. And finally, I'd really like to acknowledge my citizen science uh, collaborators, especially the Miller Walker Community Salmon Investigation and Puget Soundkeeper and the Thornton Creek Alliance. So those are all the people who um, did some amazing work to help make this uh, research study uh, possible. So there's an issue in uh, Puget Sound, right? Um, the real issue is why can't fish and people coexist? And here in the Puget Sound, um, video possible for something like uh, 20 or more years now. And you can just watch this for a few seconds here. This year, uh, in the middle here, is an adult female coho salmon. It's beautiful, silvery, uh, perfectly healthy fish if it wasn't um, in this creek just after it rained. Um, this fish probably was in Puget Sound maybe two or three days before this video um, was taken. Uh, in the fall, these coho salmon sit off the mouth of these watersheds and they wait for it to rain. And when the creek rewaters, re uh, they come back into the watershed to reproduce, to spawn. And um, they're basically totally fine until it rains. And um, within a few hours to a day or so after raining, uh, these adult coho salmon actually die in many watersheds across Puget Sound. So something that's in that stormwater is killing peri-urban coho salmon. And that is definitely telling us uh, that there's an issue there. I'd also like to say this is, this is actually a cell phone video taken from one of our citizen science collaborators. Uh, it's on Miller Creek, which is right near SeaTac Airport. If you've ever flown into Seattle, you landed at SeaTac Airport, which is actually the headwaters of this watershed. Um, if you were standing down there by this fish, you would struggle to know you were near an urban area. This is not channelized. This is not banked up and rip wrapped. This is not full of trash. The water looks great. Um, there's very little trash in here. There's no oil floating on this. It, it looks very pristine and it's relatively wooded. I mean, in some places it's actually difficult to see the houses that are up on the high banks uh, above the creek. So it's, it's really a nice looking habitat, but something in that water is toxic en enough to kill this fish very quickly. And so this has actually um, been the subject of a lot of NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service and US Fish and Wildlife Studies for actually about 25 years now. And you know, uh, one paper here from I think 2011, Schultz et al, the recurrent die-offs of adult coho salmon returning to spawn in Puget Sound lowland urban streams. Uh, if I were to summarize this, urban stormwater runoff kills these salmonids in about one to four hours. Um, right now the name uh, that this is called as Urban Runoff Mortality Syndrome, or ERMS, and its cause is unknown. It's not pathogens, it's not metals, it's not pesticides, it's not pHs, it's not ammonia, not dissolved oxygen, you know, none of these things. What's also really interesting and something I want you to remember is that the coho salmon seem to be the most sensitive salmonid. Uh, these coho salmon die in the exact same storms where uh, cutthroat trout and chum salmon, which are also can be present, survive. So it's an issue of disproportionate sensitivity and something in the water driving water quality impairment. Um, a couple little bit, uh, a couple more pieces of background information. This phenomenon was first reported in the uh, 1980s up in Bellingham, Washington. 
there was actually a fish hatchery there uh, that was relatively near. Bellingham, by the way, is right up near the Canadian border. Oops. Um, uh, if you look, it's up in northern Washington. It's probably about 150 miles north of Seattle. And that fish hatchery knew that if it rained, they actually had to shut off the water intake to the hatchery because if they left it open, the coho salmon would die for about two or three days after the rain. There was something in that water that would kill those fish. And then in the 1990s, uh, Seattle spent millions of dollars restoring urban watersheds. And one of the criteria for success was they wanted successfully reproducing salmon back in those creeks to establish that the restoration was successful. Uh, the salmon came back, people were out there watching them, kind of trying to count them and you know, establish that the restoration worked. Uh, the salmon were back, but then it would rain and the next day they'd find the salmon dead downstream, you know, 50 or 100 feet. Um, and that was like uh, Jay Davis and Steve Dam and some of the Seattle Public Utilities people. And this, these set of observations really spurred a bunch of research uh, where for the last 20 years or so, NOAA has been documenting this. And in the most impacted urban creeks, over 90% of the salmon run actually dies prior to spawning. It's correlated to urbanization and roadways and population modeling actually says you could predict localized extinction within 20 years um, for these specific watersheds where this is happening. And as you can see, here's uh, some data from Feist et al. This is throughout the Seattle metro region. I mean, pretty much everywhere you can imagine Washington state is growing with the strong economy, a lot, you know, pretty similar to the San Francisco Bay area. Um, impacts of anywhere from 10 to 40% or even over 40% and even up to 90% are predicted. So um, I always appreciate going after Lee. Uh, basically our lab does a lot of the same water quality assessment that Lee Ferguson just described about an hour ago. We're also using high resolution mass spectrometry, similar software platforms, similar instrumentation. Uh, actually Lee's got way better instrumentation than us. We're more like moderate resolution. Um, mass spectrometry rather than high resolution mass spectrometry, but we're using it for the exact same applications to try and understand unknowns in these systems. So here's a few examples of some high resolution mass spectrometry chemical identifications in urban waters here. Over on the left here, you see a group of chemicals that you might uh, predict should be in these urban receiving waters after storms like chromaton and herbicide cotinine and nicotine metabolite, caffeine. Anywhere there's people, there's caffeine. D, anywhere there's people, there's D, right? So our high-res mass spec sees lots of the same chemicals that everybody else expects to see if you're around people, right? So we have some good validation data there. And then we see things like diuron, right? Another herbicide. But this one starts to get a little more interesting. We actually start to see it pop up in some more interesting places. For example, many people don't respect that compounds like diuron are sometimes mixed into paints. There's actually a reason like mold and algae don't grow on the side of your house. Or if you're on a highway, there's nothing growing on those yellow or white stripes. So there's actually pesticides and herbicides that are actually mixed into those paints to keep that paint nice and pretty. Or even the, the side of a bridge, you know? Um, so some bridge paints also contain these. And then uh, surfactant series, like the polypropylene glycol series here down at the bottom. Um, there's lots of these things. These things are like ubiquitous in urban receiving waters. And then we get to some chemicals that are just a little less present in the environmental literature, things that people aren't paying nearly as much attention to. Uh, things like cyclohexylphenylurea and hexamethoxymelamine. These are actually constituents of tire rubbers. Uh, these are chemicals which are leaching out of the tire rubbers and occurring in these um, urban receiving waters. So let's, let's just take a look at HMMM here, the hexamethoxymethylmelamine compound as an example. Um, this is a compound that's actually used in tire rubbers to bind the steel belt to the rubber. So the steel treads so it doesn't float around in the rubber either when the tire's being made or when the tire's being used is bound with this hexamethoxymelamine compound. It's also used in automotive plastics as well. So tires are not the only source of this. But if you look at a busy multi-lane highway, like State Route 520, one second here, uh, over here in the middle, uh, hexamethoxymelamine or HMMMM is present in that runoff at something like eight micrograms per liter. Um, so pretty high concentration for a trace organic contaminant. Urban receiving waters like Thornton Creek might have it up to a couple hundred nanograms per liter. A more remote creek, maybe a few nanograms per liter. Miller Creek near SeaTac gets up to about a microgram per liter sometimes. 
And even in the Puget Sound near shore, you can detect this at tens of nan nanograms per liter uh, in winter seasons after storms. So um, this compound as well, um, we detect at least six or eight derivatives and related transformation products. EU reports have about 26 transformation products and it's even detected in raw drinking water supplies. Um, so this is a good example of a tire derived chemical that's kind of environmentally ubiquitous that not a lot of people are paying attention to. I think when we published on this in 2018, we were the first reports in North America. And so one thing we did to try and understand this coho mortality phenomena is we tried to understand what chemicals were always present in waters where coho salmon died in the fall, right after these rainstorms. So we used a combination of laboratory studies along with uh, field events like a Miller Creek uh, urban runoff mortality syndrome event in 2016 and a lower Duwamish event in 2017. And when we put those through our high-res mass spec analysis, we found that there were 57 chemicals that were always present if coho salmon died, right? So we tried to create this urban runoff mortality sig uh, uh, syndrome signature or fingerprint to help us maybe understand uh, sources, like what was explaining this phenomenon, what was going on with the water quality. Um, so we went and we looked through those 57 detections and over time we identified about 35 of them and we explained about 75 to 90 percent of the total peak area that the high-res mass spec instrument detected. And what we learned when we did this was that nine of the top 10 peak area detections in that urban runoff mortality syndrome signature were compounds that were also present in tire leachate. So if we just ground up some surface tread of a tire and put that into water for about uh, one day, nine of the top 10 compounds were also present when these coho salmon died. So that really started to tell us that, you know, roadways were definitely involved, traffic was involved. These are things that, you know, no one knew, but the water quality was certainly confirming that. And um, so we really started to pay a lot of attention to tire derived chemicals in urban receiving waters. And uh, in fact, some of our statistical analysis was actually clustering field observations um, of mortality down here at the bottom, like the Miller Creek. Um, sorry, my, my computer's uh, uh, lagging a little bit. I'm not sure why. Um, so our statistical analysis, that cluster analysis that Lee showed us was actually grouping a tire wear particle leachate along with actual field observations of uh, urban runoff mortality syndrome, basically saying that the, the water quality in a, in a receiving water where coho salmon were dying actually looked a lot like tire tread leachate, right? And so this really spawned a bunch of research. And for example, this is a headline in 2018, something's killing coho and salmon in Seattle, car tires are a prime suspect. So kind of based off this work, Jen McIntyre at the WSUP lab was um, doing ecotoxicology studies at the same time. So what uh, Jen and the US Fish and Wildlife Service, this is Ken King here, these blue columns over here on the left are actually packed with ground up tire tread leachate. We basically made a mixture uh, from nine tires of both new and used tires, packed some cloth bags with it, put it into these blue columns over here on the left and created 1700 liters of tire leachate in this big stainless steel tank and then expose that to coho salmon and chum. And, uh, and there was a control, by the way, of groundwater exposure. That's what's here over on the uh, right, I believe. And so um, if you remember the actual field events, chum salmon survived these mortality events, coho, uh, sorry, chum salmon survived these stormwater events, coho salmon do not, right? So Jen tested this. Um, and basically, we made tire leachate at a strength of about what we call 320 milligrams per liter. It's roughly as strong as you might expect to see in a, a busy multi-lane roadway runoff. And we leached that for about 24 hours at ambient conditions, which is about 10 degrees Celsius at this time, and exposed the fish for 24 hours. And so Jen repeated this study four times. So there's actually 64 total coho and chum salmon adults in this study. And I'll say some of those chum salmon adults were, you know, 15 pound fish, 18 pound fish. Some of the coho salmon were five to 10 pound fish. So we're talking about really large fish here. And what Jen found was that um, all of the chum salmon in the control 
survived. All of the chum salmon in the tire leachate survived. Um, all but one of the coho salmon in the control survived the 24 ex hour exposure. And all of the exposed coho salmon, coho salmon exposed to tire leachate died. So by making a tire leachate um, solution that was equivalent to a busy multi-lane roadway, Jen showed that this would kill 100% of the exposed adult coho salmon exactly like we see out in the field. So obviously we knew there was something going on with tire leachate, right? And um, Jen, you know, does some dilutions and her lab, you know, you see these nice sigmoidal dose response curves. You can also get uh, sigmoidal, beautiful looking dose response curves if you do these same studies on roadway runoff, again, like the, you know, which includes more than just tire leachate. And actually, if you align them based on the strength of like the tire derived chemicals in them, those lines fall almost directly on top of each other. Uh, more interestingly, from a treatment and management perspective, the safe dilution level is two and a half percent. So Jen needs to take roadway runoff and dilute it all the way down to two and a half percent before she can get coho salmon to survive the exposure. So think about receiving waters and how many receiving waters might have two and a half percent or more roadway runoff in there. And she also found that any exposure greater than 60 minutes was unrecoverable for coho salmon, even if you put those fish into clean water after the 60 minutes. So that tells you even a very short exposure window to roadway runoff is lethally and irreversibly toxic to these fish. So uh, we work on chemicals in water. Uh, something was going on. We started trying to identify these toxicants and we did fractionation studies. And I'll slightly speed up here a little bit. I'm, I'm very conscientious of the time. Um, most of you are familiar with fractionation, right? We're leaching these tire particles into water. We're manipulating it. We're trying to get the toxicity to either stay or move or do something. Trying to identify if the chemicals coming through these manipulations are still toxic or not. And through that, we learn about uh, the chemical properties of the toxicant or toxicants. Um, so over two and a half years, we basically manipulated water quality and followed the toxicity. This is basically an, an effect-directed analysis, or TIE. Again, many of you are familiar with this. Here's a picture of our lab. Um, so we did a whole bunch of steps. This is basically the front end of our fractionation. And we isolated a single toxic fraction. And so tire wear particle leachate starts out with more than 2,000 chemicals or features uh, by the HRMS analysis. Uh, if we go through all of our fractionation steps shown here in our first HPLC column, we can get that toxic fraction down to about 200 chemicals present in it. And we followed this actually with two more uh, HPLC fractionation steps where we created uh, 10 fractions. So there's actually, in our final fractionation, there's three HPLC columns in series. And through all that effort over those two and a half years, um, we took those 2,000 features down to about four chemicals in the final toxic fraction. Um, Ed, I'm not, Ed, let me just break in. Just last call. Yeah. Last call. You've got about I, two, I know. Minutes, I'm, two minutes. I'm super close. <laughs> okay. So uh, thanks. Thanks, Richard. Um, so we, we got this all the way down to four chemicals. And uh, I'm not telling you exactly the last steps or what the chemical identity is, simply because this paper is currently in review. Um, but we know what it is now. Uh, we have a chemical identity, we know the source, we found what we think is the primary causal toxicant, and it's a toxic transformation product. Um, so what you see in this picture here, um, we actually, with the, this toxic product, which is far more toxic than the parent compound it comes from. Here's the parent compound at 20-fold higher concentrations, after 24 hours exposure to juvenile coho salmon, there's one dead coho salmon in this tank and one symptomatic fish. Meanwhile, the toxic transformation product, there's symptomatic coho in 90 minutes and they're all dead in three to four hours, right? So it's a good example that transformation products can actually increase in toxicity relative to the parent. Um, again, in the interest of time, I won't go through this. Um, there's a whole bunch of sublethal Im impacts that are important with respect to stormwater as well. Look up some of Jen's publications on growth impairment, cardiovascular toxicity, and sensory neurotoxicity. But uh, my outcomes from what I want to just mention here, 
Microplastics, crumb rubber, and environmental studies are indicating uh, a real recognition of tire rubber residuals in roadways as important sources of organic compounds, uh, sorry, contaminants. We identified a tire rubber derived toxic transformation product as the primary causal toxicant for acute mortality in Pacific Northwest Coho salmon. Um, it's not a PBT chemical, it's just a T chemical. So I want you to think about how we manage things that are just toxic. A little relevance to California and the US West Coast. Uh, we have samples of both Seattle and Los Angeles area roadway runoff, so busy multi-lane highways. 100% of those samples are above LC50 values for coho salmon. And San Francisco based stormwater impacted creeks, four of the 10 creeks were above LC50 values. And uh, in, with respect to treatment, bioinfiltration completely removes the toxicant. Bioswales uh, cut concentrations by about 50 to 80% as far as we can uh, tell. So I'm um, sorry for the cliffhanger with respect to identity. We're awaiting publication and I hope you have more uh, information here very shortly once a decision is made. So how can big uh, fish and people coexist? And then my final um, kind of slide here is I want you all to think about all that rubber wearing off of our tires and roads. So don't ever look at a highway the same way again. If you look over here on the right, all those black strips that down the middle of the highway are actually meaningful. They are tire rubber and coho salmon are telling us it's important to pay attention to them. I'll thank my group. There's some publications you can look up for some of our prior work. I hope another one is coming soon. And if you have questions for me or Jen, there's our email info. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, the next speaker, Josh Bratt, has 25 years of career experience in urban creek and watershed planning and restoration. And he spearheaded the creation of the city of Berkeley's first watershed management plan. Josh is now a senior environmental planner, project manager for the San Francisco Estuary Partnership, where his current work focuses on developing green stormwater infrastructure, planning, implementation, and funding tools, as well as strategies to promote widespread GSI use. So Josh, um, please share your screen and take it away. I'm trying to unmute and find my file here to share it with you. But it's not coming up as easily as I would have hoped. Josh, this is Melissa. Just let me know if you want me to share my screen and then Nina, can you give you permission to drive from my computer? Uh, I think we'd better do that. Okay. I think we'd better do that. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so I need, to shop, I need to stop sharing, I guess. Yep, yep. Well, as it comes up, uh, I just want to say uh, good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to speak with you all. I am been invited to speak about the state of green stormwater infrastructure in the Bay Area. Um, I am a senior watershed planner at the San Francisco Estuary Partnership, and my work is focused on green stormwater infrastructure planning, implementation, and funding strategies. Next slide. Um, and, and as we go forward, uh, next slide, please. The Estuary Partnership is a collaborative organization. We work with agencies at all level of government, uh, nonprofit organizations, citizens, uh, the academic community, science community, regulators, to pursue projects and programs that protect and restore and improve water quality and habitats in and around the Bay. Um, I'm looking at the slide, it looks like it's still stuck. Are we all seeing the same thing? I should be on slide number two. Yeah, sorry, one second, Brad, or Josh. <laughs> it's okay. 
Um, and I'll say that we, we have a challenging elevator speech as an organization at the Estuary Partnership and that we're a national program under the US EPA's National Estuaries Program, but our fiscal and administrative home is with the Association of Bay Area Governments and our staff are employees of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Um, and I will tell you why that's all important in a, in a second. Um, but as we, as I get into my talk, um, I always like to give a bit of uh, context as to why green stormwater infrastructure is a preferred strategy for the Bay Area um, with a quick uh, watershed development 101 lesson. Um, again, I don't see my slides passing, but as they, as <laughs> if they were coming through, um, I've got a slide that shows um, essentially uh, the Bay Area watersheds prior to development with vegetated landscapes, um, various ecosystems, oak woodlands, riparian, um, grasslands, all various shades of green. And then my next slide shows satellite imagery, uh, looking down at uh, the city of Oakland and looking at the Bay Area from outer space where you can see that what was green is now gray, except for the undeveloped hillsides and parklands um, because our watersheds have been hardened and engineered to keep the developed areas from flooding by shunting stormwater and other urban runoff into the drainage networks that eventually discharge to local creeks in the bay. Um, and on the ground, what that looks like are um, flood, flood control channels where we have open box channels where creeks used to be, they're straightened, uh, they have very little habitat value. A lot of our um, native creeks and streams are full of trash, um, floating products and the like. And urban contaminants where, you know, when it rains, you can always see that ubiquitous uh, rainbow sheen of, of oils. Um, and all of these things hurt habitat and water quality. Um, and the good news is that green stormwater infrastructure is here to recreate some of that natural watershed function of capturing uh, stormwater runoff close to the source. I'm on slide seven. There you go. Uh, holding that water um, as long as possible in contact with soils to filter pollutants and discharge that cleansed water either through subdrain piping into a storm drain system or infiltrating into native soils. This picture is an example of interpretive signage that's uh, being installed along a project that I'm managing on San Pablo Avenue in the East Bay. Um, and the graphic basically shows that mechanism of water sheeting into a landscaped area and then that cleansed water eventually getting out to the bay. And uh, this graphic is available for any municipality to modify and use in their own green infrastructure projects, specifically green street projects, to help brand the concept of green streets into the public consciousness. Next slide. Uh, green infrastructure is a decentralized distributed approach. Um, it needs to be implemented at a scale that's comparable to the issues that, is, that are being addressed. And so the approach needs to be widespread within a watershed to aggregate the water quality and hydrograph benefits. Uh, the San Francisco Bay Water, Control, the water Quality Control Board has set a course over time of steadily pushing for green infrastructure in its iterations of the municipal stormwater permit, uh, beginning with the countywide clean water programs, developing construction and sizing guidelines for various uh, green infrastructure typologies and new and redevelopment projects of a certain size triggering green uh, infrastructure requirements. And uh, that first wave of projects, which still continues, uh, largely impacted the private sector uh, that were pursuing parcel-related improvements. And the parcel-based approach is often termed uh, low-impact development, or LID. And so here are some examples of uh, a green roof to the upper left, um, a rain garden on the upper right, and uh, rainwater harvesting um, at Heron's Head Park uh, in a building capturing, capturing uh, stormwater and using it for um, toilet flushing. Next slide. The next wave of requirements uh, from the Water Board included 10 pilot Green Street projects across the region, uh, which helped to really recognize that nexus between stormwater management 
and the impervious uh, road networks that generate tremendous volumes of runoff and pollution, uh, including tire fragments and, and rubber waste. Um, and SFE, SFEI has long been a partner with the Estuary Partnership in promoting green infrastructure. Um, SFEI has been at the forefront of monitoring many of the first generations of uh, pilot projects across the Bay. Uh, they put together a synthesis of, of studies and uh, literature review uh, into a document called the Bay Area Green Infrastructure Water Quality Synthesis Report, which is on their webpage. Um, and this graphic uh, that's being shown right now is from a pamphlet that they produced after um, repeated monitoring at a um, array of green infrastructure uh, bioretention cells in El Cerrito that was built in 2010. Um, they were able to do 11 storms where they sampled influent and effluent, uh, showing um, nine, over 90% reductions in PCBs, suspended sediment concentrations, and microplastics. Um, in their sampling of, of uh, what's passing through these systems and what comes out. Next slide. Uh, in dealing with the scarce, scarcity of dollars on the local level, uh, green infrastructure um, makes a compelling case for stacked benefits beyond pollutant interception and treatment. Uh, it slows the time of concentration uh, of, of stormwater flows accessing the centralized stormwater uh, drainage system. Uh, it adds street level landscape amenities, it improves public pedestrian safety, uh, reduces heat island effects, and hopefully, you know, these, these uh, surface-based treatments unlock public support and approval for financing of stormwater management needs, which is really an un underfunded um, activity that all municipalities really have to take care of. Next slide. Uh, the most recent uh, and significant steps in promoting widespread green infrastructure implementation, again, come from uh, the Water Board stormwater permit requirements, uh, including submittal of watershed-based green, uh, green stormwater infrastructure master plans, uh, reasonable assurance analysis for specific pollutant reductions like PCBs and mercury, and allowance for alternative compliance. Um, the watershed master plans and reasonable assurance analysis plans were due to the Water Board in September 2019, and, and they have planning horizons that are to show what the expected uh, results would be on the planning horizons of 2020, 2030, and 2040. And um, clean, uh, clean water programs, the countywide clean water programs, uh, use consultants to develop and run GIS-based analysis and hydrologic modeling to create their plans. Um, SFEI developed an early version of this approach called Green Planet, which is also available online and free for municipalities to use. Um, Tan will be discussing some of this in his presentation next. Next slide. Um, and as I mentioned that the Estuary Partnership lives within the Association of Bay Area Governments and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Um, and these entities produce what's called uh, Plan Bay Area, which sets regional goals and priorities for achieving sustainable community strategies in the realms of land use planning and transportation planning. Um, and to make a case for considering green infrastructure in the upcoming iteration of Plan Bay Area, uh, the Estuary Partnership uh, worked with consultants uh, Brown and Caldwell over the summer of 2019 to compile and analyze the master plans uh, for each county while they were still in draft form. And this next set of slides show the projected costs of these draft plans, which may have changed, you know, since they were uh, submitted to the Water Board. Um, but, you know, we have reports from five counties. Uh, go back up. I'm not done with that one. Um, but it says that impervious surface runoff from about 16,000 acres are expected to be treating using green stormwater infrastructure, uh, either through regional facilities, green streets, or parcel-based uh, low-impact development. Uh, regional projects, uh, unlike green, uh, green street projects, are, are larger projects that capture and treat water from very large drainage areas, usually for flood attenuation, but they can offer water quality treatment or infiltration also. 
uh, two of the counties um, analyzed reported that their plans should reduce uh, PCB inputs to the Bay from their jurisdictions by about 20%. Next slide. Um, and all this treatment would be done in an aggregated footprint across the Bay of about 650 acres, uh, with Green Streets taking up about 14% of that, uh, low impact development 27%, and regional projects about 58%. Next slide. And then there are the costs to this. Um, we were able to do cost projections from a low end to a high end, um, but you know, basically the, the low end cost of, of doing all of the work would be about $3.13 billion. Next slide. And the high end of this work is about $6.35 billion. So uh, next slide. This work is expensive. Um, especially if it's a standalone project to install, you know, water quality based retrofits into an existing space. Uh, I'm managing um, a project called the San Pablo Avenue Green Stormwater Spine, uh, which started way back in 2012. Uh, it has multiple grants uh, that have been funding it um, from design all the way through implementation. It was envisioned as seven projects in seven cities to treat seven acres. Uh, over time, that has uh, evolved to uh, treating six acres uh, with four sites, and they should hopefully be completed by Christmas. Um, but, you know, and so I'm look, we're looking now at the conceptual design for Berkeley, which was a very simple one of installing a number of uh, curb extension planters that uh, eventually discharge to a storm drain inlet right over Cordonesis Creek, which is a salmonid bearing stream in Berkeley, uh, in the Berkeley Flats. Uh, next slide. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's complex, there's many businesses, there's driveways, there's trees to protect, there's fire hydrants, there's lamp posts and all that, permits, um, landscape management agreements between uh, the local jurisdiction and Caltrans because uh, this part of San Pablo Avenue is also part of the state highway system. Uh, next slide. These projects, when they start to go, are also a bit of modern ar archaeology. Uh, utilities are not always where they're supposed to be. They're often, um, they can be very old, very brittle, subject to damage. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's delicate work there. And we'll talk about utilities as I go forward. Uh, next slide. We'll just race through these next three. Um, this is that site uh, as it's initially planted. This is a rendering of what that site is supposed to look like. And the next slide is where it looks, what it looks like today. So pretty close. Um, we feel really proud of that one. And like I said, it was, it was actually one of our simplest ones. It's just curb extensions with curb cuts uh, leading to this space. Uh, next slide. Um, there's an array of challenges uh, in getting to the implementation of these watershed green stormwater infrastructure uh, plans. Um, uh, green stormwater, infrastructure, it's a newish approach. It seems like extra work to an already burdened and under-resourced staff at the municipal level. Um, stormwater management is woefully underfunded for the demands that it has within the cities across the region. As I mentioned, um, this work is costly if it's a standalone retrofit project. Um, that Berkeley site treats um, one half of an acre at a cost of over $340,000 not including the design or construction management costs. So I would always recommend that this kind of work be a part of a larger uh, public improvement project, that it's a, a component of a larger project where more can get done uh, you know, at, at one time. Uh, funding and capacity constraints, projects are often funded through a combination of sources. Um, as I mentioned, my project had um, it had EPA funding, it had natural resources agency funding, it has Caltrans funding, it has uh, Department of Water Resources funding, and all that leads to a lot of uh, reporting burdens and having to understand what the limitations of each funding source is. Um, and in terms of cost, there's also the long-term cost of operations and management, which is not always uh, accounted for. Uh, the next three bullets, physical space, utility, inf Utility information and uh, water quality sizing requirements are all related. Um, as 
you know, these, these installations uh, do require, you know, th there's physics to them and they require, a, they require gravity control drainage uh, to a properly sized facility. Um, and it's always easier if there's drainage infrastructure to tie into. Um, however, you know, as I mentioned, uh, under, underground, it is a mess under there. There's a lot of extra coordination needed to identify the alignment and depths and construction requirements for looking, working closely uh, with other utilities that are underground. They need to have a certain amount of cover at the end of the work. Um, and often relocating these pipelines um, comes at a project cost um, because the utilities do not want the responsibility of restoring uh, rain gardens and green infrastructure as opposed to hardscaping if they have to go in, access their pipes, and then restore in kind what they've uh, what they've disturbed. So, you know, they, they, uh, these utilities need to get more familiar with, with this approach and how to restore that in kind. Um, otherwise, we're facing really, really high costs for moving pipelines. Um, as I mentioned, water quality credit for the facility is based on the sizing requirements that are established. Um, and that can really encourage oversized uh, installations, especially with the first generation. Um, you know, with, with you know, uh, subsequent uh, green infrastructure really um, reducing the tributary area. And, and so maybe these could be smaller. And if they were smaller, then that would decrease the likelihood of design conflicts with, um, with all of the existing surface uses and subsurface uses that are going on. Uh, public jurisdictions, stakeholders, there's a lot that goes on in this public right of way. Um, and because we tend to work in silos, I uh, really am a strong advocate for intra agency and inter agency coordination from the outset. Public engagement and community meetings are recommended to inform uh, the early design process. Uh, and I would say that the SFPUC and the city of San Francisco have a really good model for public watershed planning and having uh, charrettes and, and really teaching about uh, green infrastructure and its benefits. Um, and there's, there needs to be permits from lots of different entities. Um, and I would say that particularly Caltrans and local traffic control uh, permits can take a lot of time and require a lot of multiple iterations. And uh, finally, um, how is progress tracked? Um, the clean water programs have software platforms for tracking their own progress towards, you know, achieving their, the uh, municipal goals associated with their master plans. Uh, my hope is that SFEI's tracking tool that is part of the uh, Green Planet um, software might be the home of the region's consolidated data set that shows really in real time how we're doing as a region in terms of implementing green infrastructure and reporting the uh, pollutant loads that are being intercepted. Okay, Next Josh, slide. But, um, this is my last. Okay, good. Carry on. Yeah, my uh, my last slide here is an offer to uh, access our web pages um, at the Estuary Partnership. We have a um, a dedicated page that has information on uh, planning, policy, funding, uh, design guidance, and implement implementation, and case studies. I will say, unfortunately, um, our, our webpage is being renovated right now. It's under, under construction, so uh, this page uh, may not have all the resources available at the moment, but I'm going to ensure that they're back up uh, by Thanksgiving. And thank you so much. Thank you, Josh, and um, thank you for handling uh, gracefully the, the little technical glitch, I think. Um, <laughs> Everything went pretty smoothly after we got that going. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank thank you for advancing. Yeah. I'm glad glad we sent those sent those along. <laughs> That's right. Cautionary tale, right there. Yeah. Um, Tan Z, our next speaker, got his PhD in civil and environmental engineering from Duke University, and before joining SFEI, he worked as a Tetra Tech consultant at that other lesser known Bay Area on the East Coast called Chesapeake Bay. Tan is a hydrologist and watershed and stormwater modeler, focusing on modeling the sources, transport, and fate of water contaminants to better support answering the types of management questions that regulators like myself have. So Tan, please take it away. Thanks for the introduction, Richard. So 
I'm Tam. I joined FSCI in the last day of 2019. I consider myself as a <clears throat> model booster because I spend more time with models than with my wife. So today I'm really happy to introduce uh, some of our work focusing on modeling to estimate stormwater contaminant load. The stormwater is a major pathway for contaminant transport. The pollutant like tile wheels, like it just told us, and uh, uh, pesticides, those will accumulate on the land surface and then washed off by the stormwater runoff and enter the bay where well, the natural channels and the stormwater pipes. For some of the pollutant, the portion that is transported by the stormwater is significant. For example, 69% of PCBs are transported by the stormwater into the bay and uh, over a quarter of mercury were transported while the stormwater pathway. So to better evaluate the water quality in the bay, we need to find a way to quantify the pollutant loadings while the stormwater pathway. So today I will introduce some of our uh, work focusing on estimate stormwater loadings and the different scales. We first will see a regional scale work, including the watershed drains directly into the bay, and then we will zoom into a smaller scale, the city of Sunnywell, and see what models can be done there. So first of all, we, we will focus on how to estimate the stormwater loads from those bay adjacent watershed and their upstream watershed. So the white lines, white lines are boundaries of the watershed and the blue lines are major channels and streams. We hoped we could use models to estimate and even predict the water flows into the bay while those channels as well as the sediment and contaminant. So considering uh, estimate the loadings to the bay, one key, key word is uh, variation. So the factors that impact or control the contaminant transport process, such as the imperviousness, soil type, geology type, land cover, land, land use are varied in space and the rainfall driving the stormwater runoff process varied in space and time. You can easily see the temporal variation of the rainfall in this region, and the annual average rainfall varies from 12 inch to more than 66 inch, spatially in this region. And on top of those variables, there are hundreds of reservoirs and other artificial controls that change the rainfall runoff process in this region. So here's just two photo examples of how the artificial controls can change the rainfall runoff process. So knowing all those spatial and temporal variables that controls the contaminant load, contaminant transport process, we build up a dynamic watershed model using the LSPC model. By considering the spatial variation I just mentioned, uh, into the model and also drive it with a high resolution temporal and a spatial resolution uh, rainfall data. So with that, we were able to mimic the dynamic system and the different space and time. So as a first step, we now model the hydrology of this region and uh, we model the fl uh, stream, stream water, uh, stormwater flow into the bay from more than 80, 80 80 outfalls surrounding the bay. Now, here we show the comparison between our model stream flow in orange and the monitor stream flow in black. So those are a few examples of our calibration site. We can, in general, the model have a very good performance in the uh, hydrology simulation. For all the calibration sites, the relative error of stormwater volume are less than 10% and the shape of the hydrographs uh, matches very well too. So now we have a tool that can uh, give us estimation of the stream, uh, stormwater flow and the different space and time. We can, we, now we want to uh, launch a pool question for the audience. So for which of the bay adjacent county has the most stormwater flow into the bay for the year 2000 to 2006? So you can, Put in your answers with your knowledge in Geography 101 or just give a random guess. And uh, San, Francisco, San Francisco is not included because it's the 
uh, con combined sewer system, the stormwater flow uh, flows into a, a different pathway. Okay, so now let's see our poor results. Is there, okay, let me. Okay, we see Alameda has a really good uh, leading advantage. So let's see if that is the case. So we will reveal the answer while a uh, county stormwater race. So ready, set, go. We can see Alameda had a really off, good off start with a big storm in 2000, but Manapa is catching up, leading the race. And Sonoma came to the second place, trying really hard with every storm it gets, but Napa respond with a larger drainage area to the, into the bay and it keep its leading advantage all the way to the end. So now we have the Napa, the first place, second, Sonoma, and Alameda, the third. So congrat congratulations to the audience that select Napa, but there's only bragging brats, no, no other, word, other word for that. So hopefully um, with this storm race, we can have some sense of the dynamics of the system. It varies both in space and time, but keep in mind the variation in hydrology is just the very bottom level of the dynamics in terms of the estimating the uh, contaminant load. So the contaminant load are also highly related to the sediment load and also the uh, uh, pollutant concentration in sediment and also in the dissolved phase two. So we will, now we have a working hydrology model. We will continue working on simulating the sediment dynamics next year, as well as we will set up the uh, POC modelings to support the TMDL regulated uh, POCs as well as emerging contaminants. So stay tuned to our um, county sediment race next year in our annual annual conference. Now let's switch in gears to a smaller scale. And uh, by the way, this is how I travel this year, very convenient. Um, so when we focus on a smaller scale, the requirement of the modeling are different. Some processes uh, should be represented in the model with more details, such, such as uh, management activities implementation of control measures. Like George just uh, introduced, the GSIs can be a uh, core major control measures to reduce stormwater contaminant load in the urban setting. It can reduce uh, both stormwater volume and the pollutant concentrations in the stormwater. Most of GSIs uh, do not have large footprint and are distributed within a watershed. So to better evaluate the control measure effect on stormwater contaminant load, models should be able to simulate the hydrological process within a single GSI, as well as can summarize the impact of GSI at a larger spatial scale. So the following work I introduce in today is about the modeling small scale hydrological process and upscaling it to a larger extent. I'm also trying to extend the stormwater treatment a little bit, not only looking at the GSIs, but also um, nature-based solutions, trees. Um, because trees, we can consider it as a less efficient GSIs. And uh, though it's less efficient, but it's also much cheaper than the GSIs. As George told us, the cost of the GSIs is a challenge in its implementation. So one, uh, one of our question is, if we can consider trees and the GSI together, would that give us a better solution? So in order to do that, we, uh, we need, like there will be a three-step process. So first, we, first of all, we need to represent trees in the model. Then we need to upscale the analysis to a larger extent. And then we want to find out if there's a, a optimal solution using optimization tool. So to, in order to simulate the trees in a similar way as the GSIs, we looked into the most common used stormwater uh, model, EPA SWIM. So for the EPA SWIM, it uses different modules like surface, soil storage, 
for those different modules to represent hydrological process happen on different layers. And with the different combinations of those modules, uh, the swim can represent the, can simulate the different type of GSI. But for trees, what is lacking in the swim model is, uh, it does not simulate what happened within a tree canopy. So in order to uh, address that question, we pull out the uh, canopy algorithms from iTree tool. The iTree tool is a tool that to quantify the benefit of trees. So we pull that algorithm out and plug that into the swim model. So we create a canopy module in the swim model, allow us to simulate trees in the swim model with the similar ways of the GSI. So with our new developed module, uh, we were able to quantify the hydrological benefit of individual trees with different sizes. The bar chart here shows uh, stormwater captured by the uh, canopies of trees and the different sizes. And similarly, we can also identify the hydrologic benefit of trees of different species. So here the bar chart shows the runoff coefficient of four different land surfaces, impervious, pervious, uh, deciduous trees, and evergreen trees. Similarly, in the urban setting, the street trees will have different designs and the different uh, ratio of the impervious area under the canopy. So we will able to we're also able to use this new developed module to simulate the hydrology benefit of different designs of street trees. With that, we used uh, average size trees and the number of different uh, street trees and park trees per each sub worship in the city of Sunnywell to scale it up. And we, by comparing the uh, swim model results with and without trees in the city of Sunnywell, we are able to quantify the runoff reduction of current existing trees in the city of Sunnyvale. And we found that the current trees intercept about 10% about of total runoff of the city of Sunnyvale in the water year of 2002. So our next step will be using the Green Planet tool that we developed uh, to figure out if there's uh, optimal GSI plus tree scenarios in the stormwater management. So the Green Planet tool uh, is a set of tools. It has a geo GSI site locator tool that can give you the, all the opportunities within the AOI and uh, that you can implement, implement the GSIs and plant trees. And with a combination of modeling tool and the optimization tool, uh, the this tool can give you an optimal scenario of GSIs and the trees. So the optimal here, we mean the most cost effective, effectiveness configurations of GSIs and the trees in terms of the runoff reduction. And also, as Josh mentioned, we also have a tracker tool to track the implementation of the GSIs. So the work I just introduced can be summarized with three steps. To first to represent small scale hydrological process user model, and then scale it up to a larger spatial scale, and then use optimization tool to give you a better planning, planning scenario. So this is another way of uh, using model to support the stormwater containment load estimation, but more focusing on the planning level. And if we're looking from a more broader angle, those better, uh, better stormwater management planning can be one aspect of the multiple multi-benefit of general urban greening activities. So in the future, we hope to bridge the other, uh, other benefits of the ur general urban greening activities like the biodiversity, uh, urban heat island effect, all those other benefits together to see if we can come out with a better solution. To summarize, I introduced two modeling projects focusing on the stormwater simulation and the different scales. Uh, in the future, we hope to build a more integrated monitoring and modeling framework to better understand the water quality of the bay. We want to use the uh, regional watershed model with uh, data support of our stormwater, uh, stormwater monitoring program and the varied numbers of uh, watershed to give us a better estimate of the loadings into the bay. And we can connect this with our receiving water model, the bay model, and with the support of our monitoring within the bay, we can better quantify the water quality dynamics in the, in the bay. 
And also we have other program, uh, projects going on at the marginal regions and also as well as the conceptual models that will help us to better quantify the fluxes in and out and also give us better scientific insight of the modeling work. So take CECs, for example. So we now have three different types of project ongoing to trying to address the management questions. First of all, we have a multi-year stormwater monitoring program, and we also have the conceptual model and the dynamic models. So for the uh, stormwater monitoring program, that will provide the data support to the both models, and the conceptual model can, can provide provide the fluxes and the scientific insights to the dynamic model to better structure the uh, CEC modeling. And the, the, the flow and the sediment results from our dynamic model can be used by the conceptual model to better quantify the fluxes. So there's two way arrows pointing to, to each other. So um, we want to, what we want to do is what we're trying to leverage and integrate it, all the effort together and the work to a cleaner future. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tan. Um, I will get the ball rolling with a, a question for Ed. Um, oh. Um, can everybody hear me still? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm gonna start this question with an observation and the observation is a sobering one that a lot of our water quality headaches, once again, involve dealing with contaminants originating in consumer products, um, in this case, tires, and having a toxic compound in tires is really bad news because tires are found everywhere, they go everywhere and um, you know, dealing with the tire wear debris using treatment, it seems like it's going to be a heavy lift. So there's um, two parts to the question for Ed. First, what do you think of treatment as a feasible approach for road runoff and its toxic constituents in the Puget Sound region or elsewhere? Um, and the second part of this is that I realize that the identity of the compound that you're identifying is new, but do you have any insights or information about whether tires can even be reformulated to eliminate the compound or compounds causing the toxicity? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer those questions, may, you know, maybe almost together a little bit. Um, you know, I, I think um, when we identify something, it does give us opportunities for source control or green chemistry and alternative substitutions. And, um, you know, I'm not an industrial chemist. I'm not a polymer chemist. I don't know what the potential for substitution is. I have to think that something exists out there, right? I have to think that we actually don't have any chemicals which are so vital that we can't substitute them out for something which is more environmentally friendly or better for humans and, and things like that. So I'm, I'm very hopeful about the ingenuity of chemists in general. Once they know there's an issue to be worked on, that we can probably do something about it. Um, I think the trickier question comes from the fact that, you know, we have so many chemicals in commerce and so many chemicals coming out of these consumer products. Um, you know, my high res mass spec is telling me there's like 5,000 chemical detections in roadway runoff and 2,000 or 2,500 when I make a tire rubber leachate, right? And I think, you know, there's all these chemicals that are partial toxicants or induce sublethal effects that just nobody's working on and we might not know anything about over the long term. And I think those are the ones that really, I think, spur a focus on GSI and treatment and just doing, doing something because I think it's going to take us a long time to really get ahead of accurately evaluating chemical toxicity in these complex mixtures. Um, and so for that reason, I think treatment is merited. Um, oh, you know, over the medium term, I do hope we can reformulate out anything which proves to be especially risky and problematic. Okay, um, thank you for that. The next question is actually going to be answered by RMP staff. So the three presenters can um, take a little break. Um, the question is today we saw two great presentations about 
non-targeted analysis, both outside the Bay Area. Um, um, so could RMP staff describe whether and how this approach is being used in the RMP and in the Bay Area? Hi, Richard. Thanks. I think that question's for me. I'm, I'm Becky Sutton and I lead our emerging contaminants work. And as part of our emerging contaminant strategy, we do employ non-targeted analysis uh, as a special study from time to time. And so actually our, our most recent a non-targeted analysis that we completed was one that we worked on with Lee Ferguson. And it was presented maybe a, a couple annual meetings ago. And that's actually the one where we first got interested ourselves in the stormwater contaminants and these tire related contaminants. So follow-ups from that study were that we started working with Ed Cologe on a special an, a multi-year special study. Uh, we also worked with Lee Ferguson, or we, we are currently working with Lee Ferguson on a follow-up study on ethoxylated surfactants. So the non-target analysis was great in kind of reorienting our attention toward the stormwater pathway that we maybe hadn't been looking enough at previously, and it brought to light some new contaminants that, we've done, that we're currently working on as follow-up. Okay, thank you. Um, could somebody let me know if they can still hear me because like my Zoom has like given up the ghost and I can't get back to it. So somebody just tell me if they can hear me. We can hear you. Okay, good. So we I can see you. Okay, good. So I can't get back to that. Um, so I'm going to ask um, one, other, one other question. I, I have it written down in a separate document, luckily. And this is to Josh. Um, when I am biking or driving around the Bay Area, my heart starts to beat faster when I see a newly installed GSI system and I just inspect all the plants and I just, I, I'm so happy. But what I'm wondering is if you have any information about what the public in general thinks of these systems. So is word mm -hmm. getting out that the, what these systems are for and what the benefits are and importantly, if the public is going to support them with dollars um, to have more widespread implementation in the future. Uh, yeah, Richard. Um, I don't know that there has been real study about um, how that messaging is coming across and how people are really internalizing what they see out there or, or what they're reading from the interpretive signage and, and getting on board. I know that clean water often pulls very, very high. Folks appreciate clean water, but they don't uh, really associate the storm drain network with the water system itself. Um, and so, you know, these, like I say, these surface level kind of improvements are that opportunity to um, not treat the storm drain system as a trash can, but to show that um, trash actually accumulates at surface level in these facilities, which kind of is a, you know, um, a, a reminder with your eyes that there's just so much trash and litter flying about, whether we can see it or not, you know, how small it might be. Um, which is why the signage is important. So um, I don't know if it's resonating yet, um, but I do know that when polls come, clean water is something people will expend on, but they won't expend on storm drain pipes. So um, I don't have any way to get back to the to the Zoom. Um, so at, I I'm kind of like flying blind here. I guess you could. See me, but are we um, done with the session, or if there's maybe another uh, question that Jay could ask? Um, if yeah, let's let's uh, throw a question to Tan. Okay, I, actually, and I do I do have one for him. Should I ask one of the ones that we discussed, or? Um, well, there's one from the audience, and okay, then cool. It's kind of specific, so if yours is more general, maybe we can do that one too. Okay, go, uh, go ahead and for yours. So, Tan, you could I think you can see the question, but it's about. Uh, it's asking how is impervious coverage represented in these small scale watersheds if the NLCD is used to estimate the impervious coverage are the trees not already represented in those data and that's a good clarifying question so for the urban uh, urban watershed model the swim I just talked about the imperviousness is using the NLCD impervious layer but the tree canopies were extracted from the earth defined data. So earth defined data has the has the high resolution images that identify the tree canopies in the city. And I think they have data available for the whole California. And the differences with the um, NLCD data and the tree canopy data there is we're trying to 
adding a canopy layer into the into the model. So with uh, just the pervious area and impervious area of the model, it just uh, uh, simulates the hydrological process in the, on the land surface. But you're lacking the another layer of the canopy level layer that can intercept the uh, precipitation and also change the change the hydrograph. So hope that answers your question. And then I'm going to seize this opportunity to ask a question of mine for Ed. <laughs> um, uh, if you wonder if you could share what you know about green stormwater infrastructure in the Puget Sound area, and um, and you know if you have anything more to say about how it how it uh, how useful it is for treating the street and tire runoff. Yeah, so um, again, I'd really point to looking at some of Jen McIntyre's and Matt Schultz publications on this specific topic. Um, they've actually published more in this area in the last few years than I have. Um, in general, what those studies say that if you infiltrate stormwater, you get it to flow through, you know, soil or a, a sand compost type mixture. There's very substantial um, treatment uh, happening there with um, no evidence that there's any toxicity to salmon on the effluent mixture there. When we look at those systems, the bioinfiltration systems with high-res mass spec, we see about two-thirds of the chemicals are removed completely. Maybe another 20 or 25 percent exhibit partial removal, and then maybe 10 or 15 percent of the chemicals seem to go mostly, you know, right through with limited or no removal. So uh, you're getting like 90 percent or more pretty effectively. Uh, when you look at things like bioswales or some of these overland flow systems, um, it does depend on the specific constituent. There's a little more variability in what happens, but even, for example, for the coho toxicant, you know, um, a bioswale or a vegetated uh, buffer removes maybe, let's say, 80%. So you get something close to log removal for a, a transport system, as long as you're having that contact with vegetation and grass and organic matter somewhere. Um, once the flows get too high and these systems swamp out, I don't think they do too much, but um, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of what we see. So in general, if you can push it through dirt, um, that'll go a long way to scrubbing organic contaminants out. Thanks, Ed. Um, maybe one more. And uh, uh, Josh, this one will be for you. It's the question from, question from Lester. Um, what are you hearing and seeing as the primary barriers to implementation of GSI at a business as usual scale? And then there's some more to it that can you, you can probably read that yourself. Um, Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think I think um, it's still too early to tell, and I don't know that we're we'll get to the business as usual element of sort of compulsory, you know, green infrastructure with every project that rolls through and rolls out. Which is, um, you know, I think where when I came on board, that's that's that was always my vision. Um, but now with these uh, the watershed management plans or the green infrastructure management plans, you know, it's it's more about being. Um, not opportunistic, but being strategic about where things are going to be set and at what density. So, you know, I think these plans will sort of show whether this this approach is going to have legs or not. You know, how far um, cities can go in implementing the plans themselves. Um, I think that, you know, just by the eye test, I'm seeing a lot more installations just in my daily life as I travel around the Bay Area. And I'm pleased to see, you know, um, small retrofits or large scale projects going on. Um, I think that the biggest barrier uh, will continue to be uh, operations and maintenance, long term maintenance of these types of facilities, uh, particularly with the budgets that they have. And it kind of goes back to that other question that was asked about people accepting these and and really uh, appreciating them. And I think uh, that appreciation will only go as far as uh, the maintenance of them and how long that they look good and look tended and are, are adding that kind of um, aesthetic benefit. Uh, but once they uh, become neglected and all the plants die out or the irrigation system isn't working anymore, then it's going to be a blight. So, you know, I think cities are 
recognizing that and trying to create a, a, a realistic balance of what they can maintain before they put it into the ground. Um, they're also looking at, um, you know, we have a project in, in downtown Oakland and that's going to be stewarded by the, uh, the downtown business improvement district. So that's, you know, that's ancillary and helpful um, tending by a group that is dedicated and paid by all of the businesses downtown to do that uh, streetscape uh, maintenance. And I think that's kind of the future of it is anything that um, cities can do to share the maintenance burden with the locals, I think uh, will go a long way. Thanks, Josh. So Richard, I think we're at the wrap up time now. Oh, just in time, my, my <laughs> Zoom is just like starting to smoke. And <laughs> so um, thank you very much presenters and um, per, uh, the, the participants and attendees who, who hung in here. For this whole time, I, I can't see like, how many of you are left. Maybe Jay has a number of the hardy souls. 173 still left. That's, That's pretty great. good. Pretty good. Thank you very much for a, a wonderful day with lots of good questions and lots of good, lots of great presentations. And um, I think that we accomplished Luisa's objective for sure of a, of a wonderful day of, of science. So I think is uh, the wrap up is going to be by you or Tom. Is that correct? Or I me. Okay. So thank you, Richard. Thank you for, yeah, and, and the speakers. Yes, right, another good session. I think we've, uh, we've had a very successful day. I hope that's the case, but we'd like to know whether, how well you liked today's program. So it's, it's we only can get better through getting, getting uh, feedback and, um, and critique from you. So please, Fill out the uh, the survey form as you leave the meeting. Or can you? Is that going to be sent? That will be sent to everybody, right, Melissa or Jay? As well it as it will just show. It will just show up as you close out of the meeting. Oh, super! So we're all going to get it, <laughs> and then yes. uh, and then think, looking ahead, we're up. You know, we're hopeful that we're going to have a live meeting next year back at the the. The Browner's, uh, the Browner, uh, Brower, yeah, in in Berkeley. I mean, we actually have, of course, we we already have a deposit because we had to cancel. The meeting. But it's scheduled next year, October 14, 2021. So uh, mark your calendar and you know, plan on attending the best day of of science in in the region again next year. So thank you all, thank you speakers, thank a number of you for participating on a regular basis. I hope this worked well enough for you. I know we missed the social encounter of seeing each other during the breaks and lunch at the live meeting. And um, very, very importantly, none of us are gonna miss the, the, the social encounter that many of us have after the meeting where we can continue, would continue dialogue, et cetera. But, Look forward to the future where we'll make more of that happen and uh, and continue to engage all of you. And yeah, thank you for the newbies uh, who participated for the first time or uh, you listened in. And uh, we'll have to consider in the future how we may provide access to more people considering the the live meetings have uh, have a, a attendance constraint and, you know, due in part to facility as well as cost. So we'll figure something out to optimize participation in the future. So again, thank you all and uh, be safe and do your best Thanks. to improve water quality in the Bay Area. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thank you guys. <laughs>so does the uh, survey does it does it take over your computer and it won't let you do anything until you complete it or is that a no you you can not, close the browser window but that to be a it's, joke, but, uh, you know, like, it's uh, gonna direct you first thing <laughs> we ransom your, your ransom everybody's computers and they can't get it back without taking the survey it seems logical but not
appropriate. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Appreciate Tom. It. So, Josh, were you actually answering one of those questions? Yeah, okay. Looks like Peter Tango is still on. I thought he said he got off a while ago. Mm -hmm.